And good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number six of the nature of Middle Earth. Uh, just a few quick announcements before we begin here this evening. First, uh, coming up in just a couple days is Bay Moot, our third regional moot of the year. We're going to be in the Bay Area out in California. Specifically, we're going to be in Berkeley, California. Um, I'm uh, going to be flying out there in a couple days. Looking forward to seeing folks out there and getting to connect with folks who are just going to be um, able to attend digitally because of course this like all of our other moots is a hybrid moot so if you're in the bay area still time to sign up and come and join us in berkeley this weekend on saturday but if you can't uh, you are welcome to join us digitally uh, through our digital interface so uh, go to signumuniversity.org events and you can find the bay moot link there uh, and the registration link there for bay moot um, gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, the theme is sacrifice. We're going to be looking at a bunch of uh, uh, really cool, uh, we're going to have some really cool discussion together, as well as hearing some um, uh, some really great presentations. It's not going to be like a, a normal conference where you go and you like just listen to other people talk all day. Uh, this is going to be a much more interactive kind of conference, uh, so it should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to that. Um, the second thing is I wanted to remind folks that uh, time is running out. If you want to be able to vote to help determine which uh, modules we run uh, this December uh, in our first ever uh, set of space modules, we have a really exciting group of folks, really excited and exciting group of folks. Uh, we have a lot of signups. There's been a huge response to space, which I'm just delighted about. Uh, th that program is going to be so much fun. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that start up and to seeing where it goes. Um, but we're going to be announcing uh, the confirmed modules, that is, of all of the modules we have available, which are the ones that the people who have currently bought uh, tokens have chosen. Uh, for December, because uh, as I said, it's student driven. So I don't even know exactly which ones we're going to be ultimately running. But I'm getting a better idea looking at the lists as we're starting to narrow them down. And we're going to be announcing that early next week. So if you are thinking about participating in space, if you want to uh, be a part of some of our modules there in our first month in December, um, or if you want to give um, a, a, a token to somebody else uh, so that they could uh, enjoy our modules in December, then I definitely recommend uh, that you buy your tokens here in the next day or two uh, so that you can be part of this determination process. There's still time to sign up for our confirmed uh, modules after, uh, you know, after next week. We'll be keeping registration open through the end of the month, but they'll be set by then and you won't be able to influence which ones get offered. So you might end up having to wait until January uh, for one that you wanted to do if uh, it doesn't run in December. So anyway, just wanted to uh, uh, urge you to do that. One of the things I want to draw people's attention to also, um, one of the areas of the modules that we are uh, offering, which I think is really, really cool because I, in, in my experience, this isn't an opportunity that you can find anywhere else. I don't know anywhere else that does things like this. There are lots of places where you can go to learn languages. And many of you I know have spent time, invested a lot of your own time and energy in learning a language. Um, like maybe you've spent some time learning uh, Old English or Latin or something like that. And but of course, as we all know, those of us who have done that, and I've learned both of those languages in the past, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And over time, like it just kind of decays and fades away. And one of the things that it's I have never really seen anywhere else online um, is a place where you can go for refreshers to like maintain, to practice, uh, to keep your hand in uh, and keep your language uh, fresh and in the process, of course, uh, get to read some more cool, fun texts that you've never read before. We offer several of our space modules, which are designed to do exactly that um, for not just beginning language classes. We have those, too, um, but advanced language classes for folks who have studied it before and want to keep themselves current, right? Want to, Or even want to try to revive it a little bit. Maybe it's been a few years uh, and you want to try to get back to it. This would be a really good way to do that too. Um, so we have several event. We've got uh, Latin and Old English options uh, for the fall. 
uh, we've got, uh, I know, several folks who are hoping that our uh, Old English one is going to run. So uh, we'll see. That one's coming down to the wire. Um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to mention that because I think it's a really fun opportunity. So those, you know, we're, we're going to be expanding those as well. I'm hoping to be doing uh, kind of, uh, you know, reading modules of this kind um, in uh, for, for more languages. Uh, right now we have Latin and Old English. We're probably going to continue those. I'm probably going to add Old Norse uh, as well for those who have studied Old Norse. Uh, and uh, we, we could do others uh, also, Greek and, and various other languages. So um, I will be interested to see how that little thing develops over time too. But I wanted to draw folks' attention to that. Anyway, one last announcement, and this is a Mythgard Academy specific announcement, because of course those of you who are in our Council of the Wise, including uh, so many of you who donated so generously during our recent fundraising campaign, um, have been voting on our next book. Now, as you know, we're not exactly threatening to finish the nature of <laughs> the nature of Middle Earth any day now, right? We're still going to be in the nature of Middle Earth for a couple months. Uh, there's no question about that, right? Uh, however. Uh, we needed to determine which book are we going to do next because we have a rule about not doing any two books by t by the same author uh, in a row. So after the nature of Middle Earth, we're going to do another non-Tolkien book, and then we're going to do go back to the War of the Jewels and resume our study as we're coming towards the end uh, of the history of Middle Earth. Um, but again, we needed one in between, so we had a um, uh, we had an election. Uh, recently, those of you who were, are in the Council of the Wise have been uh, contacted by the uh, the head of the council, uh, the head of our order, uh, Ed Powell with the Mind of Metal and Wheels, uh, who has uh, been tallying the votes. And uh, for those of you who were not part of that, here are the finalists. Uh, so there's one round of voting to elect the finalists, and then there's another round to vote among the finalists and determine the winner. And the finalists for our next Mythgard Academy book were Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, Paralandra by C.S. Lewis, and Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Footnote. Um, Canterbury Tales, you guys must be insane. Do you think we're... <laughs> Do you know how long it would take me to get through the entire Canterbury Tales? Oh my goodness. Like, what? Uh, seriously, all of them? Like, including the tale of Melaby and everything? <laughs> like, seriously, we would be... We would be like two years studying the Canterbury Tales. We'd probably have to break it up, uh, I think. Uh, but anyway, here at, at the winner, the winner is the Alice books. Lewis Carroll wins. Uh, so Queen Me says Alice. Um, and so since, by contrast, Alice in Wonderland is such a short book, I'm going to add a bonus. We're going to do both. We're going to do Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Um, and in part, I say this for like purely self-serving bases. I love Through the Looking Glass. I, I like Alice in Wonderland. Like Alice in Wonderland is fun. Um, but like to me, Through the Looking Glass is like an order of magnitude beyond uh, Alice in Wonderland. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I rather suspect... Uh, that both Lewis and Tolkien agreed with me in that Lewis and Tolkien both quote and allude to through the looking glass many, many, many times throughout their works. Both of them do. Um, and uh, But very much more rarely uh, to the original Alice in Wonderland itself. Um, so anyway, we're going to do them both. So uh, you can, there's, a, there's a, a really good paperback collection that has both uh, Alice, uh, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass um, uh, in the one volume. It's still a really short uh, work, even with the both of them put together. Um, so that's what we're planning to do next. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm delighted. I've actually been hoping we would eventually get to do Through the Looking Glass uh, because that is just such a fun book. I haven't taught that book in a long time. I did Through the Looking Glass. I included Through the Looking Glass in the syllabus of my Hobbit class, my, uh, my MA course on the Hobbit that uh, I did in the Signum program that I originally did years ago. Good grief. When did I do that? Fall of 2012, I think I did that originally. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're going to... Um, uh, 
it's, it's been a long time since I've really sat down and taught my way through, and, I, and I've never taught them through both of them back to back, so it's going to be a lot of fun. So that is what is coming next when we finish The Nature of Middle Earth, but in the interest of finishing The Nature of Middle Earth, we should probably proceed with The Nature of Middle Earth. So I want to do a quick review. Um, uh, and if you're paying attention, you'll see that I went back like four slides. I'm not going to redo them. First of all, apologies for the abrupt ending of class last time. Um, uh, last time my internet just went out. Um, it just blinked out at the end. Um, and I was literally, I was like one or two sentences away from saying, okay, it's getting late. I'm keeping you guys too long. I should let you go. And then my internet just went out. So I totally pulled an Aragorn and was like, I shall take this as a sign that I was supposed to stop. Uh, and, uh, and so just stopped. It was a good thing I didn't try to come back because it kept... Uh, my internet kept uh, sort of flickering on and off uh, for about an hour after that. So um, anyway, that um, uh, so again, I apologize for the uh, uh, expeditious exit I made last time. Um, uh, however, OK, um, I wanted to just kind of go back very briefly. I wanted to uh, return to the final slide we were doing. We had been discussing this sort of chart here that he made when he was mapping out the Great March, right? When he was describing blow by blow, right? When he was really thinking through how many miles can they travel per year and what was going on, right? Um, so I'm not going to redo everything that I did in the last like half hour of class last time, but I did want to, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to just kind of jump back into the middle of it. So, um, so you'll remember just a little brief remembering, right? We have the first journeys right there in the first year. And we were noticing how suddenly this looks very different, not only because he has, you know, he's working out the details, but what I loved most is the way in which we get this now superimposed onto the Middle Earth map that we know really well, right? So the first break that they take, right? The first place where they establish uh, a camp uh, and break the march for the first time is by the Sea of Rune, <coughs> where they pause for procreation uh, and hang out there for a couple hundred years of the sun, right? Um, but then they move forward and in the plains to the east of Mirkwood, uh, southern Mirkwood, um, they stop to farm for a few years, like you do, right? It's kind of like the equivalent of stopping for a light snack, right? Except for it's several years worth of crops uh, in on their part, but it's all good. Um, Gerald, there is a distance scale on the Middle Earth map, at least. Um, it's, it's interesting, Gerald, because it never really, I never, I think it's there on the print version. I never paid much attention to that myself. Um, but I believe it's there. Tolkien certainly had it worked out um, very, uh, very, very carefully. Yeah, Stephen, exactly. Only elves could form a nomadic farming culture, right? I mean, like, that's not very common <laughs> in human history, right? Normally you're one thing or the other. You're either nomads or you're farmers, right? Uh, only when you live life <coughs> on the elvish time frame can you be a nomad and yet take a, a brief hiatus of your nomadism uh, to grow crops for several seasons and then pick back up as a nomad, right? That's not very normal, uh, but apparently it was for them. But then, of course, we saw how they were setting off to enter Mirkwood, but they ran into trouble. And the trouble that they ran into was that there were evil things lurking in Mirkwood already. <coughs> so that, as we can see, Mirkwood was, as I said, sketchy from the start. Um, it's part of the, like the, 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 the mythic identity of Mirkwood is already established, right? And it's already playing the role literally from like the dawn of time, right? Mirkwood is already a forest that people are nervous about crossing, just like the dwarves didn't like to think about setting off across Mirkwood in The Hobbit, right? Well, apparently the original elves uh, on the march to Valinor felt much the same way. Um, uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Um, no, Michael, uh, on YouTube, I, I, I see that comment. Um, no, no, uh, 20,000 was uh, what he said. So, now, keep in mind, Michael, there were a few different places where he was spitballing different numbers. Uh, you might be remembering the one where he just sort of threw out the first thing, like maybe there are like 15,000, five of them stay and 10,000 go. That seemed to be, he seemed to be playing with proportions and things like that. But then when he went through and did the generational math, right, if we start with 12 pairs of elves and, and then we apply uh, the life cycle of the elves and how long the gestation period and the recovery period and the growth period is and all that sort of thing. Um, how long is it going to take? And when he did all that math, that's when he emerged with 20,000. Um, uh, but as we're going to see later on in tonight's class, he's waffling about these numbers. He's not ironclad on any of these numbers. He's playing with a bunch of different things, um, but he clearly has not like firmly made up his mind. And this is just the thing always to be keeping in mind, and it, it can be hard to forget sometimes when reading something like The Nature of Middle-Earth, but then again, one of, the, um, one of the things which can be misleading, I think, about the book itself, I mean the physical book, is that this is a, a lovely book. That's not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing that this is a lovely book. But what I mean by that is that can be misleading in the sense that it makes it look all official, Right. Um, it, it's <clears throat> kind of inevitable when you publish material like this, that you're taking what was for Tolkien jottings on the back of a, you know, in the margin of a sheet of paper. Right. Um, just brainstorming and changing your mind and trying it out a different way and all those kinds of things. And, you know, because it's being printed in a book like this. Right. Um, it looks like. It's totally official, right? Uh, and so it can be easy to forget that, um, you know, it can be easy to think in terms of like, hang on a second, isn't there an cons inconsistency here, right? Well, yeah, yeah, of course there is. But it's not, it doesn't even count as an inconsistency. This is just him changing his mind, or rather him trying out multiple ideas. Um, and we'll see him doing that. We'll see him returning um, uh, pretty soon. We're going to get back to him returning uh, to some of these early uh, concepts of the Awakening of the Elves and trying something quite different out at right around the same time, right? So it's just important to keep that stuff, uh, to keep that stuff in mind. Um, yeah. Now, Martin, I agree with you that it is interesting that many of the notes in the early chapters are described as as clearly written and well put together. Um, it is true. And although he is doing Mary, just as you say, brainstorming and world building, that's clearly what's happening. And sometimes it seems to me, uh, it sounds to me, I should say, as if his target audience is really himself. Right. Like him talking aloud to himself, him writing to himself. Right. Just to kind of get these ideas out on paper. Martin, as you say, that's not always the case. There are some times where it seems like he is. Um, I don't know, kind of dressing it up. Right. Like packaging it as if he is going to present it to someone else. Now, does that mean that that's the final product and we should pay more attention to that than other things? I don't think necessarily so. Because it seems to me likely that even that very process itself, the process of writing it out clearly and presenting it as if he's going to publish it, right? As if he's addressing an audience, right? His readers. Um, that seems to me also part of his process of thinking it through. Like, I think that that kind of helps him uh, to put things together uh, in a way. Um, so again, I don't think that that means... He's made up his mind now, right? He's still, I think, in the process of making up his mind. But anyway, okay. So, Mirkwood, already sketchy. Uh, and remember, Orame left them, and he comes back to them... Uh, what is it? He comes back to them five years later, right? And they're like, oh yeah, we're still hanging out here farming because scary things in the woods. Um, and he drives them away. Right. And so, and then they're like, OK, now it's safe for them to go. And so one of the things that we were seeing last time is the way that they are kind of becoming dependent upon Orame here, too. Right. Orame will solve all their problems and uh, take all their take all their stuff away. Um, 
take all their problems away. And we see that, uh, we see Orame himself seeming to come to that conclusion fairly quickly, too. Um, we then saw how the Ingar and the Noldor, the Njoldor, uh, pass through Mirkwood, um, following Orame, right? Orame leads the way through the scary forest, and they follow him through the scary forest, which I love that note where Tolkien says, rich in fruit and berries, right? He doesn't want you to think that, don't picture Mirkwood exactly like Bilbo saw it, right? All black and dark and twisted, and like it's not under the shadow yet exactly. There's just scary things wandering around, but it's going to have like lots of fruit and berries. Like it's going to be abundant, right? There's still going to be much abundance there in Mirkwood in the, uh, and it's ironic, right? Again, thinking about Bilbo and our first, you know, the, the public's first encounter with Mirkwood, which of course was in the, the Hobbit Tolkien, uh, in which Tolkien published first. Um, but, um, and certainly many of our personal experience, first experiences with Mirkwood in The Hobbit, uh, correlates with starvation, right? You know, as they started to go hungry in the woods. And so it is kind of interesting that he, uh, so on the one hand, he's kind of playing true to type with Mirkwood, but he's also playing counter to type in that, hey, there's like food all over the place, right? It's a, a, a bountiful uh, 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 meals there in Mirkwood. Um, but, um, okay, so they settle down though. They settle down in the Anduin Vale, and as we were talking about last time, where do they settle down? Lorien is where they settle, or rather, where Lorien shall be. Um, and we talked about how, um, I think, anyway, this adds just a wonderful layer of richness. It both draws richness from the Lord of the Rings, right? Because we have now the story of the Great March is paralleling other stories that we know. It's coming into contact with places we know, right? With the map that we're already familiar with. Um, it's now becoming part of the world that we understand and the world that we love. And that transforms this um, in, I think, a really powerful and interesting way. But at the same time, it is also transforming that story that it touches as now we see it's, I think, impossible not to see Galadriel's settling down in Lothlorien in quite the same way that we did before, right? When we see that it was the Ingar, i.e. the Vanyar, and the Noldor who settled down there. And not only do they camp there for a while, they settle down there and we get the first piece of dialogue, which is like a red flag in a sense, right? Like, oh, look out, he's starting to write dialogue. This is going to turn into a whole story, right? He's going to, you know, but he, he does admirably, by the way, in continuing his plot outline. I, as soon as I saw the quotation marks, I'm like, uh-oh, <clears throat> I know which direction this goes. It's a fun direction, right? The, the uh, direction of the sudden emergence of story, which nobody objects to, um, but it usually doesn't uh, uh, speak for long-term success in the plot outline. Anyway, they say, why not dwell here and let the Valar guard us? This is where Quendi should dwell, between wood and water. And so seeing both things happening there, both first, <clears throat> their explicit dependency on the Valar, right? We'll be fine here. We'll be fine here so long as they guard us, right? Let us live sheltered here uh, within the guard of the Valar. And then their sense that this is where Quendi should dwell, right? Their feeling that where they are settling down is where they are meant to be. This internal resistance to the march. And only the chiefs, uh, the chiefs, that is the three uh, leaders who went over to Valinor, the three ambassadors who have seen the trees and who have seen the Blessed Realm, they are the only ones who are not content and everybody else is content. Um, and we, of course, have them lingering there uh, in the region of later Lorien, which he explicitly identifies there. We have a new begetting of children. Uh, so the second round of child begetting happens here uh, in the Lorien um, area. And the uh, Valar do, in fact, in fact <clears throat> send some Maiar there to protect them and to drive off the evil. Uh, and we're told that the place is rich in flowers and food, like so many places. Um, and although the chiefs are trying to get them to move, they are unwilling. This is now, remember, it's the Ingar and the Noldor. This is an addition to the story. This is an, an enrichment of the story, not just in detail, 
right? Not just providing us details like where it was they were settling, right? But if you read the account of the Great March in the Silmarillion, which of course, obviously, very much briefer and very much less detailed, like without the number of years and the number of miles and the number of children begotten and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, but anyway, even without the detail, what we get in the Silmarillion is that the Vanyar and the Noldor, they keep clipping right along, right? The Teleri keep lingering and splitting off, and some of them stay, and some of them keep going, right? But, uh, but, the, but the Vanyar and the Noldor, they trek right along, right? We, we get the impression in the Silmarillion that they're focused, they're determined, they are, they are ready, they are unwavering uh, in their desire, generally unwavering in their desire to uh, uh, to get to Valinor. And we see here, this is not the case. This is not the case at all. Um, the Ingar slash Vanyar and the Noldor themselves are having the same issue as the Teleri. And that just seems to me to make it more and more clear that as he's, you know, in this sort of phase of the story development, um, by which I mean like in the 1960s, like by the time he's come to, to these later years um, as he's rethinking through the stories, he seems to have decided pretty firmly that the invitation of the Valar is a bad idea, that the elves really should stay. And it begins to feel that the chiefs um, who are the ones who are not content in Middle-earth, that their discontent itself almost begins to seem, I don't want to say sketchy, that's too strong, um, but um, at least a little questionable, right? <clears throat> um, that is to say, does exposure to the Blessed Realm, does exposure to Valinor perhaps have a, a negative effect in, in, in one sense, right? Um, they shouldn't be, the elves shouldn't be inspired with the desire for Valinor, because it breeds discontent with Middle Earth, which is where they, those who haven't seen Valinor yet, all have this instinctive sense that this is where they should be. Um, so I wonder. Of course, we see that this is a parallel, right? Um, this is a parallel to what, like, there's a reason why the Numenorians aren't allowed over there, right? The ban of the Valar the ban that the Valar are going to impose upon the Numenorians is going to be for explicitly this reason, right? Because you're mortal and the blessed realm is not for you, but if you saw it, it would, um, it would, it would damage your calm, right? It would damage your contentment with even Numenor, which is already an island paradise set aside for you, right? Um, but you're not going to be content even there anymore if we let you come to Valinor. So we're putting up the ban, right? Um, and so again, that parallel, which kind of seemed like the Valar learning their lesson about what happened the first time, um, seems to um, it seems to me to have been implicit for a while back. And by a while back, I mean a few decades of Tolkien's creative life. But he was still kind of wavering. Stephen, as you're recalling, of course, he was still. we still had that remarkable quotation in Morgoth's Ring where we were told that those who said the Valar erred in inviting the elves to Valinor speak with the tongues of Melkor. Tongue of Melkor, I guess he only had one tongue. But anyway, um, yes, he certainly seems to have backed off the whole tongue of Melkor business. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, Yes. Yeah, exactly, Chris. Um, at the time, we were told, as you say, that it was it was about mortality. Right. That was why the humans weren't allowed to go over there, um, that it was their mortality was the issue. Uh, and as Chris is saying, now I'm thinking it's about the mixing in the Valar with the children. Full stop. Perhaps so. I mean, it's starting to sort of sound that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tomas says, uh, makes you think, what is men's prize after death? Uh, probably a blessed land, but better than Amon. Uh, possibly. And I think 
Tomas, that's kind of one of the points, right? Even the Valar don't know exactly what Iluvatar has for the men after death, where they go uh, when they leave the circles of the world. But um, if the desire for Amon is going to tamper with their... is going to get in the way. It's going to become an obstacle, essentially, to their looking ahead um, to their hope, right? To their hope and their Estelle uh, looking towards what is to come. That's not going to be good, right? That can only do harm. It can only do harm. As indeed we see eventually that that harm coming to pass, right? And the Numenorians focusing more and more on this world and um, uh, dreading increasingly uh, the, um, the world to come. Um, all right. This is where we finished last time. Um, let me just reread it because I don't even remember exactly where my internet cut off. Um, either by chance, machinations of Sauron, and or because Orome withdraws protection, hoping to make the Eldar less content with their new home, uh, Atyamar, winters are hard and the weather worsens. The host is now burdened with many young, born between 1129-39 and 1130-89. The oldest are those that in 1131-65 will, will be two valiant years or 26 growth years old, 314 lower, the youngest about 10 growth years. The total of these is 8,000 in the total host of 28,000. So there are 8,000 kids underfoot now in the host of the Valar. Or sorry, the host of the Eldar. The chiefs order an advance across the Anduin for spring 113091. The Teleri already show a love of water in boats and begin a great boat building. They are ready with rafts and boats in the, in the course of 113090. But a large part of the Teleri later fought this in the winter of 113091. The Anduin is wild and flooded with great snowstorms. Sorry. The Anduin is wild and flooded, and great snowstorms fall in the Misty Mountains, then much taller, which last far into the spring. The total Teleran host is 13,000 now. More than 3,000 refuse to leave Atyamar. These are the Nandor. Okay, so the Teleri finally do come through Mirkwood, although actually I think I skipped a bit. They Some of them go around it don't they? Instead, they go around to the south, because um, they're in no hurry. And um, But anyway, they eventually get there. They get to the Anduin. Um, and the Anduin Vale, where the Ingar and the Noldor are. And by the time the Teleri get there, the Ingar and the uh, and the Noldor are ready to go. Right? They're ready to set off again at last. Um, and the chiefs... Uh, the chiefs are trying to order... They're trying to get things moving, right? They order an advance across the Anduin by the Teleri, right? Come on, Teleri, catch up now. Cross the Anduin, and then lo and then we'll go. Now, we know that the Ingar and the Noldor already, right? The Vanyar and the Noldor already had been lingering there for now hundreds of years of the sun. Uh, and uh, they are... Finally, getting ready to continue moving forward. The Teleri have just arrived. The Teleri have just arrived at this place which, you know, made, inspired the Vanyar and the Noldor themselves uh, to want to stay. Um, and uh, they cross the river which they quite enjoy, right? The boating and the raft making. This is their first boat making experience, right? Rafting on the Anduin is their first experience of boating. Um, and uh, so they're, they're loving the boat building part. No problems with that. But they fight the idea of moving on. The whole of them fight. Now, eventually, of the 13,000 of them, 10,000 are going to continue. But 3,000 will refuse to stay. And these are the Nandor. Right? So the Green Elves, instead of just, again, being told as we're told in the Silmarillion, that along the way, some of the Elves decided to remain. Uh, and uh, and I, we're even told that it's before they crossed the Misty Mountains. Right? Um, but here we now know, where are they living? 
Lorien, right? Lorien and the region round about. I think some of them are still on the other side of the Anduin, right? Over by Dol Guldor, right? Or Amon Lunk, as it still is, the Bald Hill, right? Where um, uh, Dol Guldor will someday be built. Um, it is definitely, um, it is definitely my uh, my head cannon uh, that um, that um, what's his name Lenway, uh, leader of the Green Elves, uh, totally settles on Amon Planck, That uh, the place that was um, Dol Guldur was the original home of the Nandor. But also, keep in mind the Galathrim down the road. They're Nandor also, right? Galadriel is Noldor, but she's the only Noldor in, in town, right? Uh, the rest of the Galathrim are Nandor. And um, it's now very possible, right, that the Galathrim have been there, have been there ever since here, right? They've been there since Lenwe first left uh, the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the Great March. And that's kind of awesome, actually. Uh, that's that's really fun. Um, it provides us a story for the Green Elves that we really didn't have before. A context that we can really grasp and that we can begin to imagine. We can begin imagining things like, I bet they set up their camp on Amon Lunk, right? Right across the river there. Um, and um, we... Um, we don't, you know, we don't know, but again, we had nothing like that kind of context before. Also, notice, where are they not far from? Where are they not far from? Well, they're not too far from Fangorn either, right? Uh, from the forest which shall later be known, uh, presumably, as Fangorn. Um, so that's kind of fun also, isn't it? But notice, of course, also here that Orame is deliberately allowing them to suffer in order to inspire them to keep going. Orame is smart enough to realize, okay, if I just keep protecting them where they're living here, if we want them to keep moving, that's apparently a bad strategy. So he withdraws his protection hoping that their struggles will make them less content with their new home and more prepared to move on. Now, I'm not sure what I think about this. On the one hand, it seems a little like, look, Orame, if they're this, if it's this hard to get them to keep moving, maybe just let it go, right? Maybe you're, you know, Maybe you're, 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 you know, uh, trying to roller skate uphill here. Uh, but, um, but also part of me wants to say, you know, it's, uh, he's also not wrong that the, I'm going to shelter them at all times is probably not what's best for them. They're going to need to, I mean, even if they are to stay, whether they stay or go, probably best for them to learn to handle things, I would think. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Gerald, I don't think the risk to the elves... I don't think they're in much risk of death. Not at this stage. Remember, their Hroa are extremely vigorous. Um, we're told that the winters are hard and the weather worsens. Do I think very many of the elves died of exposure that winter? No. No, I don't. Um, I think it very likely that there were no fatalities. Just discomfort. Right? It was just... It, it wasn't quite as nice. That seemed to be Orame's plan. Also, notice he didn't uh, let the monsters get them either. Right? Um, so, it's a fairly gentle withdrawing of protection, all things considered. Um, yeah. Michael, there is a partial parallel to hobbits blissfully living under the protection of the Dunedain. 
Exactly. Yes. Uh, if simple folk are left free of care, then simple they will be, says Aragorn. Right. And uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's not necessarily, I think, what the Valar want for the elves or sort of should want. Um, yeah, Stephen, there's no evidence that wolves attack across the frozen river or if they did, they were beaten off. But uh, we'll see. I don't think there are. Okay. Um, now, there's more of the timeline. I'm not going to do the whole... I told you I was going to do the whole timeline. Um, what I wanted to jump ahead to, we're still in the same chapter. This is still chapter 7. Um, but I love it when Tolkien, now having worked all this stuff out... Remember, I was comparing what he's doing here to playtesting, right? Like, as if he were designing a game. Um, he's playtesting his world building. But now he realizes there's a problem, right? Um, because, of course... We now have, we still have the Silmarillion story, and as we've seen, he doesn't, he does want to preserve the overall characters and story of the Silmarillion, like the plot, as much as he can. Um, he does not seem ready to just scrap his favorite characters, scrap his myths, scrap the entire story. He's trying to make it work, right? So. Where in the present seam scheme did the chieftains come from? Ah, we've got a, a thorny aging problem here. Ingway, Finway, Elway, Olway. If first elves, they if they were first elves, they awoke in Valley in year one thousand, being approximately twenty four age years old. In Valley in year eleven thirty three twenty nine, they reach Valinor. They are then 24 plus 33, 29 Valian years old equals 157 age years. Actually, 288 plus 19,154, 19,440 sun years old. So they're, they're 157 age years, like that age equivalent he keeps coming back to, um, almost 20,000 sun years old. Clearly, he comes to the uncomfortable conclusion Finway cannot wed in Amman unless the arrangement of elvish lives is altered. It could be altered satisfactorily in this way. 1. The Eldar, especially in the early ages, do not wed or beget until late, and maybe at least 200 years old, like, you know, Finway. 2. They do not necessarily beget in consecutive times of the children, but may beget in any suitable or peaceful time at will. But they do not beget when past Hroa Prime, which was in the Elder Days about 200 age years. But this is dwindled. In the Second Age, it was 150. In the Third Age, 100. So we see how he's trying to deal with this, right? First, let's just imagine... It is it is possible to imagine that the very first elves are different in some way, right? We know that the elves are fading over time, that there is change that happens. So so maybe, maybe they didn't uh, get married until late. Right? Maybe getting married at 200 used to be totally normal, even though I just, you know, was explaining in the work that I've been doing, like in the earlier chapters that we've read together, um, uh, they don't they they get married way before 200, like around 20, right? Um, but maybe it was different in the older days. But of course, you see the problem there. That's not a very good solution. Do you see why that's not a very good solution? That's not a very good solution because um, he's already said that the early elves um, were philo procreative. They love to procreate. Procreating was like their favorite thing. Um, and uh, he was talking about how the early elves, in order to get to the 20,000 by moving day, right? Um, would have to start making with the procreation, you know, more or less instantly, right? Um, uh, so for him to now go back and say, like, early on, the Eldar didn't often get married until 200 years old, that is going to throw his calculations completely out the window. Um, he's, there's no way he's going to get to 20,000 elves if he does that, right? Right. Uh, from from 24. So 
that, I mean, yeah, you could just say that, Tolkien, but I'm a little skeptical about that solution, or at least some other things are going to have to change if you're going to make that work. But then point two, or thought number two there, is, okay, what if they're different, but the way in which they're different is not that they just put off marrying. What if they don't, like, he said in his elf world building earlier on in earlier chapters that they tend to have one time of the children. Right, there's just like this season of their lives called the times of the time of the children, um, and that's it. Right, they just they have their children in like you know one string, and then they then they hang it up. Right, then they're 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 done with procreating at that point. Um, that maybe that's what's different. So the older elves have like they can split up the whole procreating business and may beget in any suitable or peaceful time at will. So, you know, you could get, maybe he could get married. Finway, now who's causing the problems. Maybe Finway could get married. Finway and Muriel could get married early, but wait to have kids until they get, because like maybe they get married on the March or something, right? And then don't have kids until they get to Valinar. Well, kid, until they get to Valinar. Right. Um, that seems to me uh, uh, a more promising solution. Right. More promising solution, I think. Um, OK. Ingwe, Finway, etc. could postpone wedding till arrival and probably did not expect to be so long on the road. OK, so. Right. So. Yeah, okay, I'm going to keep reading. If so, however, it might be a good thing to have few weddings on the march, but Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe being special cases, as the only ones who had yet seen Amon, and so desired the children to be born there. They could be among the few who abstained, i.e. from wedding, before and during the march. If there are few weddings on the march, then either elves must awake longer than 82 valiant years before their finding, or far more must be created. 144, 72 pairs, or 144 pairs? But in any case, how would Ingwe, etc.? Okay, well, hang on, let's stop there a second. Um, okay, so this is getting better now, right? Now, you'll notice by the end of this paragraph, he's already come to the same conclusion that we were looking at about point one, right? Um, if there are a few weddings, then... Uh, there either has to be a lot more time or there need to be a lot more elves to start with. Maybe we need to have 144 pairs instead of 12 pairs, right? Um, so let's square the pairs of elves, right? Um, in order to get them up to a reasonable throng uh, before it's time to march, if, they're gonna, if there's going to be all this abstinence going on, right? So that's one option. But the other option, notice how he is beginning now to integrate it into the story, right? And I really love this. This is, to me, a very convincing reason why Ingwe and Finwe and Elwe would all postpone marriage until after their arrival, right? They're of marriageable age. They're of marriageable age, but they're like, no, 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 I'm saving myself for Valinor, right? Um, why? Because they've seen Valinor. And they, all of them, come back and they're like, no, man, I want my kids to be born in Valinor, right? Uh, so we're going to wait. And so they came back to, like, you know, their elvish fiancés, right? And they're like, hey, honey, this is great. Let's wait, right? Uh, let's hold off for a couple centuries. Um, but, uh, man, it's, gonna, it's totally going to be worth it. Wait till you see, right? Wait till you see. Um, so let's wait for marriage until we get to Valinor, then we can have kids in the Blessed Realm, and it's going to be awesome. Because, like, what could go wrong, right? The kids that will be born in the Blessed Realm are going to be great, fantastic, awesome, and everything's going to be flowers and rainbows if we do that. Um, so anyway, but it totally makes sense, right? So I, I, this is holding together for me now, right? I, I can see this. I love the way that he's notice how he's not just thinking about this in terms of like his numbers, right? His world building calculations and stuff. He's thinking about this. He's thinking this through in terms of character and motivation and story, right? He's really joining um, those two things together, 
the characters and the stories that he already had and the world building uh, that he's done. Uh, so I think that's, um, that's pretty cool. But there's still a problem, as he points out next. But in any case, how would Ingwe, et cetera, or any first elf know what was going to happen so as to postpone marriage? Yeah, that is awkward, right? I mean, okay, it makes sense after they've seen Valinor, right? But why on earth didn't they get married before that? Especially if they're first elves. If they're first elves, didn't he already establish that the first elves pretty much wake up and start the procreating cycle, right? I mean, there's no time to waste here. Uh, if we're going to hit 20, 20K. So, um, yeah. And remember, there's a gap of time, significant gap of time, um, tens of thousands of sun years between the awakening and the discovery, the finding by Orome. So they would have to have had some premonition, right? So there would have been three oddballs Right among the first elves, who were like, no, 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 thank you, thanks, but no thanks, right, honey, I'm saving myself for I don't know yet what, <laughs> right? And these, it's like that, that's that seems that's a problem, that's a problem, um, exactly, Michael, and he he needs them, like they're they're necessary for the math to work. You're right, you're right. The math was premised on all twelve pairs procreating, right? So that's one problem, but there's more. How could Elway, Olway, and Elmo be brothers? Yeah, that's another problem, isn't it? Right again, according to Silmarillion tradition, Elway had a brother named Olway. And in what sense is Olway his brother if Elway is a first elf? Awkward. Awkward. Yeah. Um, fairly clearly then. Ingwe, etc., are not first elves. What then became of the older generations? Um, so he comes to this inescapable conclusion, right? Because for all these reasons, Finwe, Ingwe, Elwe can't have been. They can't have been first elves. But if they're not, then what are the first elves doing with themselves? Shouldn't they be the leaders? Right? Especially since, remember, uh, this the pattern still holds true. The pattern of, like, the first and eldest is greater and then things kind of decline uh, as time goes on, right? I mean, it's only been a short amount of time in the big picture here, but uh, still... The idea that the first elves would be kind of losers and that later elves would be the ones who would be the chieftains, like, it goes against the grain, right? At least initially. So he's got to think this through. But notice, above all, notice the one, unqu notice the one op option that he does not suggest. He does not suggest, oh, let's just ditch the story, right? So I guess Olway and Elway can't be brothers. He never even suggests that, right? Maybe Finway and Muriel did have babies before. And, you know, Feanor was like their fourth child. No, no, he's not going to go there. He's not willing to go there. Um, so he doesn't, he is not willing uh, to reconsider any of those things. That's like the one non-negotiable. And that's interesting to see, right? It's interesting to see where exactly there's so much he's changing. Remember, he changed the sun and the moon, right? There's so much that he's, we've already kind of gotten used to that now in this point in the stories, but um, there's so much he's been willing to change about the world and how things work. And yet um, it seemed, it's beginning to, to seem pretty clear that the basic plot line of the Silmarillion is still not something that he is willing um, to uh, to mess with, to mess with. Um, okay, let's. Um, but he's got an idea. This can be got over. 
The Quendi at first, to three generations, were very philoprogenitive. I love that word. I already used, I already cheated and used that word. Um, they were very philoprogenitive. They mated almost at once with their predestined mates. It was not for some time when their young, inexperienced Fayar began to take command that their other faculties demanded fulfillment and they began to be absorbed in the study of Arda. The younger generations, therefore, progressed rapidly in strength, nobility, and intellectuality of character and made natural leaders. The first few generations, expending much vigor in begetting, were least adventurous and were nearly all Avari in the event. Secondly, in any case, elvish lords or kings, as Numenorians later, tended to hand on lordship and affairs to their descendants if they could, or were engrossed in some pursuit. Often, though we don't see it in Beleriand, since the war occupied so short a span of elvish time, and lords and kings were so often slain, after passing two hundred age years, they would resign. It would thus be young, eager Quendi of some later generations, whose fathers or grandfathers were lords, who were chosen and or willing to go as ambassadors to Amman, after which they would be preeminent and obvious, and obvious leaders in the march. The light of Amman was in their faces, and the other elves were in awe of them. Okay. Um... Yeah. Now, Stephen, I'm not surprised that he doesn't want to throw everything out either. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's surprising. I just am pointing it out, right? Um, I agree. It is surprising that he's thrown out as much as he has, right? I mean, we've already lost, uh, you know, the um, the the flower of the moon and the fruit of the sun, right? You know, uh, and all that stuff. Like, there's a lot of mythic stuff. It's the mythic stuff, especially the myth of explanation stuff, that we've lost most of already. And he's already been willing to let so much of that go. So I agree, I agree with you. It's not that it's surprising at all. Um, it's just interesting to see that... Um, I, thinking even back of Christopher Tolkien's comments, in when he talked uh, in Morgoth's Ring, right, his introductions and notes and things, when he was saying what a mammoth task it was to rewrite the Silmarillion in the context of how Tolkien was attempting uh, to, uh, uh, to rewrite it, as we can see here, him undertaking, right, here in the text that we're reading here in The Nature of Middle-Earth. Um, yeah, he's right. It involved reconsideration of so many things. And it sounded, at least I always kind of thought, that Christopher was suggesting many of the stories we're going to have to change profoundly too. And it's interesting to see that Tolkien is still up to his old tricks. We will remember, uh, those of you who studied The Return of the Shadow especially with me, will remember how reluctant Tolkien is to throw away something once written, right? Um, you will remember how persistent Odo the Hobbit was, right? Um, and how Tolkien will spend five drafts trying to figure out a better and better way to retain and integrate things in a new context. If the context is changing, right, uh, he will spend much effort trying to reconcile um, the old story to the new context before he will just cut a passage or cut a character uh, and make that kind of change. And we're definitely, we're definitely seeing that uh, um, that kind of thing again. I, j I just think that that's it's um, interesting to note is all. But okay, anyway, back to Elvish leadership. Um, here's his brainwave, right? The so we've got two different factors here, right? The first elves certainly procreated. In fact, not only did they procreate, they procreated a ton. Right? They did lots of procreating very quickly. And not only did they do lots of procreating, they did lots of procreating at a time when their own Fear had just awakened. Right? Their own Fear were young and inexperienced, as he describes. And remember also that he had been saying before that the act of procreation for both the male and the female elf, both alike, for both of them, the act of procreation takes from them. Um, it, it weakens them, 
it wears them out. Um, and so the early, the first generation of elves have, first of all, like at a time when their own Thayer were young and inexperienced, um, did so much procreating uh, that they themselves are weakened in a sense, right? They are le the least adventurous of all of them. Um, only slowly do they come to strength, nobility, and intellectuality of character, right? Those things developed in the first elves, but they developed more slowly, and that process was slowed by all of that procreating that they were doing earlier on. Um, so it's natural. It's not that the younger generations are greater or stronger or better than the earlier elves. It's that they were in a different situation. The younger generations progressed rapidly compared to the older ones in strength, nobility, and intellectuality because their fear had the entire growth period, right? As they were growing to full age to expand and develop. Um, and so they became more adventurous, more eager to learn, um, stronger, stronger both of body and of character. And so they made natural leaders. So it was natural that the, they should have been led not by the greatest and wisest of the first elves to awaken, but by one of the younger generations. And I think that's kind of interesting. I think that's very interesting. And then he puts the cherry on top. It fits the pattern. It works. It works in the big picture of the stories he's already told and worked out, right? Look at the Numenorians. It is natural for them to hand off leadership. So this tradition, we know that while still in the vigor of life, right, um, before they fell into their dotage, uh, the Numenorean kings would hand on lordship and affairs of state to their descendants, right? Elves did the same thing, we're told, especially if they were engrossed in some pursuit. Leadership, kingship, is not the main point, right? Elves are very much not obsessed with being king. They're not obsessed with having power over other elves. Um, having power over other elves, being a leader of other elves, is a duty that some are suited for and that some take on. But they are, just as the time of the children eventually comes to an end and the husband and wife... Um, begin to have other interests that absorb their time and attention, right? So, too, with kings, right? You can king it for a while, but then eventually um, you're going to want to do other stuff, right? You know, there's, uh, there's, other, uh, there's other work to be done. There's other making to happen. There's uh, many things to learn and to do. They've got their talking and their walking, right? Um, they're walking, they're minding of the country. So, uh, um, they look to hand off the leadership to their descendants. And lest you say that this is inconsistent, we don't see, we don't see Fingolfin doing that, right? Um, none of the elf kings that we know hand off their leadership. Well, he reminds us they didn't get the chance. Fingolfin died young, right? I mean, how long was he high king? A few hundred years of the sun? Please, that's like nothing. That's nothing at all. Um, he was uh, still well below, you know, the uh, change of life, right? When his attention would have shifted. Um, <clears throat> and then other kings were king even less, right? Fingon, for crying out loud, right? Fingon was king for like 15 minutes. Um, and Turgon king for about 10 minutes uh, after that. So, yeah, it's uh, valiant minutes, of course, I mean. Uh, and even the Third Age, even somebody like Elrond, I mean, he's 
still in the prime of life, right? He's not even reached the point where he would be looking to hand leadership off at some point, right? Um, remember that the elves remained by Quivienen for a longer period of time. Somebody remind me, how many years was it? What did he say? He said it was 80, 90 years, 90 valiant years, right? Uh, so what are we, what are we looking at? 90 times 144 equals, right, almost 13,000 years. Yeah, 13,000 years. So the time between when the first elves awoke at Quivienen and Orame shows up to say, hey, folks, let's march. What do you say? What's anybody volunteers for ambassadors? That amount of time is longer than the three ages of the sun combined. Think about that. Right. I mean, if we go to the old definition of the age of the sun, I mean, like from uh, from the time when the sun rose in the old Silmarillion. Um, so basically, the, 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 from the time of the return of the Noldor to Beleriand through the time of the destruction of the Ring of Power in Mount Doom at the end of the Third Age. Right. That whole period of time from the crossing of the Helcaraxa to Gollum, you know, skinny dipping in Mount Doom is less time than the time from when the elves awoke till when Orame showed up. Right? That's, um, uh, that's puts things in context, doesn't it? Right? So, is there a problem? No? No? He tests it against the stories that we have and finds, no, no this works. This works. This idea works. This idea of we want to pass things off to younger generations. So the old elves, the first generation elves, totally natural that they would not have been the ambassadors. That the a newer spunky generation. So, so we're fine. We're fine, right? Finway, Elway, and uh, Ingwe could be, um, you know, uh, 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 Spunky, young, 21-year-old in age years, right? Um, uh, you know, elves with, uh, you know, still lots of spunk and vinegar. Uh, and so they're the ones who jump up and say, take us, when uh, Orame asks for volunteers. Makes all kinds of sense and perfectly matches now his other problem, perfectly solves his other problem. Why did they not marry before they went to Valinor? Because they weren't of marriageable age. And now it's easy for Elway and Olway to be brothers if they're like third generation or whatever, fourth generation maybe. Oh yeah, no problems. No problems at all. Um, so, um, yeah. But notice how, what I love about this, and by the way, Tolkien obviously loved this too. Remember, this is what... Uh, um, uh, Carl Hostetter had was talking about footnote in one of his footnotes was explaining this is the passage that Tolkien wrote like a a big uh, was it an exclamation point or something like he 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 a star he loved this passage right he was like he, you know he said important right that was it he said important in the margin next to this um, he loved this and I think it's really cool what what do we see here right we see here him finding he has tested out this world, but he's not just solving problems. He is solving problems. He's not just solving problems, right? He's testing out the world building that he's done and he's finding that it fits. That it not only, not only can his old stories be made to accommodate the new world building, but the two of them, when he applies himself to it, the two of them can come together and build a richer story. So now we have a story of Ingwe, Elwe, and, um, uh, which one? I forget. <laughs> Sorry. Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe. Um, he, he's now made that into a much more dynamic story than it was before. We now have a, a clearer backstory. We have a context, a cultural context, right, in which these three leaders emerge. We have nothing of the sort in this Silmarillion, right? So he's enriched their story, and he's enriched his world building. Right, this business about elvish lords or kings hand, tending to hand on lordship, he didn't say anything about that. 
right? Back a couple chapters ago when he was still thinking about the time of the children and all that kind of thing, right? But it, but it fits. It works. It matches exactly the kind of elvish aging pattern and just sort of life development pattern that he uh, fit in before. And it is exactly in step, right? It harmonizes perfectly with what he's already introduced through, the, through Numenor and Aragorn in Appendix A, right? So, um, so it's beautiful, right? Uh, it, it fits together uh, just gorgeously well. And this is, you, you, can, you can feel, you can see it in the margin, right? What, what, uh, um, what Carl told us was in the margin, right? Him, uh, him writing important next to this. When things come together like this, it's working, right? You know it's working. Uh, and I think that's really fun. Um, so yes, Simon, as you say, Tolkien is the master of retcon. He, he is. Um, this ability that he has, again, sometimes he can be a little stubborn, in try like with Odo, right? Odo the Hobbit. But um, uh, but he is very, very good at bringing things together uh, in this way. And it's not just that he finally like beats on it with a hammer until it he finally squeezes, you know, the square peg into the round hole. That's not what's happening here, right? What we see when it's working, when it's working well, it results in the enrichment of both. Um, and that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, now, we move to the next chapter, chapter eight. One thing that I want to just say as an aside here. I don't know. All of these, you know, Carl has said that almost all of these texts in this time and aging file that he's working with here in part one. Um, that almost all of these texts come from around the same time, like 1959, 1960 area. And um, that's cool. Um, I, I'm not contesting the dating or anything. What is not clear to me, and I, I, I'm not, I don't know any reason to think that it should be, right? Um, that it's even sort of find out a bowl, right? Um, is exactly the sequence. So we're going to see a bunch of inconsistencies. Here's another potential inconsistency, right? We saw him say earlier on, um, okay, there are two choices, either the uh, time between the awakening and the finding has to be expanded beyond what it said in the tale of years, or there had to be more elves. Right. The original awakening has to have there's to be a whole crowd of elves who all awaken at the same time. And remember, he dismissed that at the time, saying that's bad mythology. All right. It's bad story. It's bad. It's, it's, a, it's bad storytelling and bad mythology. So that's why he went to the um, uh, that's why he went to the whole um uh, expanded time, which led to all of his uh, philoprogenitive calculations, right? Um, now, we see him going back and having another thought, right? Let's take a crack at a mythic version of the Awakening, which includes multiple elves. Could that be made to work? Let's find out. During the waking of their first Roar from the flesh of Arda, the Quindi slept in the womb of Arda, beneath the greensward, and awoke when they were full grown. Pausing for a second. Do you think that means they actually came up out of the ground? Beneath the greensward? In the womb of Arda, beneath the greensward? So there was, like, turf over them? And they, like, broke out of the turf like the animals in Paradise Lost, i.e. exactly like the animals in The Magician's Nephew. Is that what he's suggesting there? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Beneath the greensward. That they actually bust out of the ground. It's not that important. But it's interesting because he doesn't describe that in the other time. He's, this is his first time 
I say first. Again, I don't know what the order is. But what he's doing now is what he didn't do before. Before he just did it in math, right? What the awakening would look like. And now he's trying a story, right? Um, yeah. Now, Edith, I agree. It does sound a bit like the Lord taking dust and breathing life into it. Um, the association between them and, and, and dirt, right? The womb of our, them, um, the waking of their Hroar from the flesh of Arda does indeed, doesn't it, sound like in the beginning there was dirt and some of the dirt was formed into the first Hroar of the elves, but they were asleep still in the womb of Arda under the grass and then they awake. So it does kind of sound like they're made of dirt, right? Um, yeah. Oh, Simon, what a great question. Simon is saying, uh, is the significant, what's the significance of the quotes in this sentence? Yeah. He puts a few things in quotation marks. So flesh of Arda is in quotation marks and in the womb of Arda is in quotation marks. Those both make perfect sense because Arda doesn't actually have, it's not like it has muscles and like blood vessels and stuff. It's not literally flesh, right? That's a figure. As is the womb of Arda. Again, it's, there's not an actual uterus involved, right? So both of those are figures. And so he's putting them in quotation marks. But Simon's specific question is, why does he say then beneath a green sward and, quote, awoke when they were full grown? He puts quotation marks around awoke. I think because um, that's, uh, I think that's also figurative. When they awaken, which I can't help but use that word because that's the Quivier, right? That's totally the word that this is about, right? Um, when they awake, they awake as from sleep, but it's not literally sleep, right? They, they, they weren't asleep before. Um, they were not yet alive, I guess. They were sleeping in the womb of Arda, but I think the sleeping's figurative there too, though that's not in quotation marks. Um, but anyway, they awoke. So it's a, it's, it's, it seems more literal, like they're actually pretty much waking literally up, right? Um, and yet I think it's in quotation marks because that makes it sound like they were asleep and then they awoke. But they weren't, they weren't asleep, right? Um, this is their moment of creation. This is, I would presume, when their Fear are entering their Hroar. This is the moment, they're the moment of the awakening. I would have to believe, is when the Thea and the Hroa are first being joined together. In other words, Edith, just as you were suggesting, it is like unto the moment when God breathes uh, into the nostrils of the man formed from the dust of the ground, and he becomes a living creature. Right. So more is happening than just waking up. But it is like Awakening, so much like Awakening that we're going to call it the Awakening from now on, right? Um, but the first elves, also in quotation marks, the first elves... Um, Simon, I got to tell you, I don't even know why that one's in quotation marks. Because, I mean, they pretty much are first, right? I mean, that's they're pretty literally the first elves... Is he putting this in quotation marks because they, uh, this is like what they're going to come to be called? Like the eponymous first elves. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But the first elves also called the unbegotten or the eru begotten did not all wake together. Eru had so ordained that each should lie beside his or her destined spouse. But three elves awoke first of all, and they were elfmen, for elfmen are more strong in Hroa and more eager and adventurous in strange places. 
These three are named in the oldest traditions, Imin, Tata, and Enel. They awoke in that order, but with little time between each, and from them, say the Eldar, the words for one, two, and three were made, the oldest of all numerals. Footnote, and this, I believe, unless I made a mistake, is Tolkien's footnote. Tolkien says, The elder and words referred to are Min, Atta, or Tata, and Nelda, that is one, two, and three in Quenya. The reverse is probably historical. The three had no names until they developed language and were given or took names after they had devised numerals, or at least the first twelve. So notice here is uh, Tolkien saying, first, from them say the Eldar, the words for one, two, and three were made, the oldest of all the numerals. And then he immediately in a footnote says, they were wrong about this. Right? That's not actually true. It couldn't have really happened that way. Um, they can't have had names at the start, and they must have first developed language and then developed numbers, and then after they developed numbers, we're like, that's what we'll call ourselves. We'll call ourselves number one, number two, and number three. Um, but the Eldar, the tradition, the erroneous tradition of the Eldar is that the words for one, two, and three are derived from their name. Um <laughs> Michael says, this has to be my favorite footnote ever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, um, yeah, I, I, it's, notice how in the context of this footnote, he is both telling us what really happened, but also telling us about how legends developed among the elves about these guys. Notice how he's kind of putting us on our guard almost at the end of the first paragraph. At the end of the first paragraph of this legend. He's putting us on our guard. Footnote. This is not necessarily true, literally. Right? This is a legend of the awakening. This is the story that the Quendi told their children. Right? This is the story that has remained among the Quendi generations of Quendi later. But it isn't necessarily exactly accurate. And he's warned us, apparently, about that already. Anyway, Imin, Tata, and Enel awoke before their spouses, and the first thing that they saw was the stars, for they woke in the early twilight before dawn, and the next thing they saw was their destined spouse lying asleep on the greensward beside them. Then they were so enamored of their beauty that their desire for speech was immediately quickened, and they began to think of words, to speak, and to sing in. And being impatient, they could not wait, but woke up their spouses. Thus, say the Eldar, elf women ever reached maturity, ever after, reached maturity sooner than elf men, for it had been intended that they should wake later than their spouses." So, yes, they come to maturity prematurely because the first elf women were woken up prematurely uh, from their sleep. Um, uh, there's a lot of things, I think, to love about this paragraph. So, um, first, before I get into the really fun stuff, note big picture that we're doing myth of explanation again, right? Thus, elf women ever after reached maturity sooner than elf men, right? We used to have that kind of myth all the time, back in the Book of Lost Tales, especially, right? Thus, to this day, do cats and dogs not get along to each other, thanks to Huan and Tevildo, right? Uh, that kind of, you know, thus uh, do we have Ireland, right, uh, because of the tug of war, Um uh, Ireland born in a tug of war. You know, that's, yeah. I mean, like that kind of thing um, was all through the Book of Lost Tales. Still surviving with many fewer instances in the later revised Silmarillion, most of which is what is the published Silmarillion is based upon. But now... He's been moving away and away and away from that. And it would seem like all the stuff that he's doing, 
his calculations, all of his math and everything, um, seems to be moving completely beyond that kind of myth of explanation. And yet, here it is. We're back again, right? We're back again. Um, he still likes this kind of myth. And by the way, I would also add the very fact that this is a, a myth of explana a myth of explanation of this sort. Um, that seems to me to correspond with his footnote. The reverse is probably historical. Uh, in other words, we're not doing history at all. He's trying out a fully mythic version, a historical um, myth of explanation type of myth to see how this whole many elves awakening at the same time thing might fly, right? Um, okay. But now other things to love about this. We talked before about Tolkien saying things like language is the primary art and uh, talking about how, uh, how central and how important the art of language making was to the Quendi and how deliciously sort of Tolkienian that whole concept is, right? Um, but how delightful that the initial impulse to make language, right? What inspired language making in the first place? What inspired language making in the first place is the three elf men's love for their wives, right? Seeing the beautiful woman lying asleep next to them and immediately desiring to sing about it and to speak to them. Um, I can't communicate with this wonderful person lying here if I don't think of where, if I don't invent a language, right? So I have to immediately uh, make language um, in order to uh, uh, in order to enable me uh, to speak with her. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, and yes, it does suggest that the first thing that they saw upon awake, it does say the first thing they saw upon waking was the stars. Simon is wondering if that suggests that they were lying on their backs. Yes, it does suggest that to me, that they're lying on their backs. Um, and probably that they did not have to physically bust out of the earth, like the animals in the magician's nephew slash uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, which is what Lewis is drawing on when he's describing the animals there. Um, that, yeah, presumably the very first thing that Imin Tata and NLC is not the underside of the sod, right? Um, otherwise, I guess they would have called themselves the people of the earthworms, perhaps, uh, which would have been a little bit less romantic. Um, but... Um, Anyway, yeah, so they do seem to be just lying on top of it, uh, apparently, even though it does sound to me like they were quasi-gestated beneath it. But I think, Edith, it is the connection, as you were suggesting, the connection to the whole uh, f made from the dust of the ground thing. Um, being impatient, they could not wait, but woke up their spouses. So their first impulse is to take matters into their own hands, right? To not let things unfold according to the way they're supposed to unfold. That seems to me a red flag. You know, I don't know if it's... In t I mean, it's adorable in one sense, right? The infatuation of the first elves with their first spouses is adorable. Um... But the waking them up feels to me like, I don't know, again, I'm not sure if it's supposed to feel like a red flag, but it kind of does. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's keep going. And so it was. Uh, well, hang on, I skipped uh, all of it. 
<laughs> so let me talk about what came in the middle, right? Um, after this, the three of them, the three dudes, because we don't know what their wives are doing, right? The three dudes stroll around and they keep coming upon more and more pockets of elves, right? They come, they keep stumbling upon uh, more unawakened elves. And each one of them sort of claims them, right? And the, each group that they meet is bigger and bigger. And each time they keep claiming them and then they become their followers. They all wake up. The guys wake up. And then the guys wake up their wives, all of them, right? And then they become the followers of one of the three of the original elves, right? Um, and remember, one of the interesting elements of this myth as it developed um, is... Well, hang on, we'll come back to this. All right, let me just read this. This is the conclusion. Well, maybe not quite the conclusion. Do I have more conclusion? Yeah, no, this is a conclusion. Okay. And so it was that the Quendi ever after reckoned in twelves, and that 144 was for long their highest number, so that in none of their later tongues was there any common name for greater numbers. C conclusion. Elves language was just like rabbit language in Watership Down, right? Uh, just like rabbits can't count above four and call anything above four rare, so apparently elves didn't count for a long time above 144. Um, I don't know that they used the word rare, but they must have had a Quendi version of that, apparently. Uh, anyway, okay. And so also it came about that the companions of Imin, or the eldest company, of whom came the Ingar, were nonetheless only 14 in all. And the smallest company, and the companions of Tata, of whom came the Noldor, were fifty-six in all. But the companions of Enel, although the youngest company, were the largest. From them came the Teleri, or Lindar, and they were in the beginning seventy-four in all. Now the Quindi loved all of Arta that they had yet seen, and green things that grow, and the sun of summer, and... and sorry. I'll come in again. Now the Quendi loved all of Arda that they had seen, and green things that grow, and the sun of summer, were their delight. But nonetheless, they were ever moved most in heart by the stars, and the hours of twilight, at morrow dim and even dim, in clear weather, were the times of their greatest joy. For in those hours, in the spring of the year, they had first awakened to life in Arda. But the Lindar, above all the other Quendi, from their beginning were most in love with water and sang before they could speak. Hey, they're just like rabbits. They're crepuscular like rabbits too. That's great. Oh man. So see, I never thought to see so many parallels between uh, rabbits of Watership Down and the original Quindy. But anyway, okay, so back to our various myths of explanation. Let's start with the latter paragraph, actually. Um, notice what he's trying to do here. I am tempted to say, it might be going a little too far to say this, but I am tempted to say what he's trying to talk himself into, right? We talked about things that he's holding on to and things that he's unwilling to change. Or things, no, things that he's holding on to and things that he has been willing to change, right? Um, and we've mentioned, I've mentioned, that one of the things that he has been willing to change is the later coming of the sun and moon. He said from the beginning, of, I mean from the beginning of this book anyway, from the beginning of this little period of, uh, of rethinking, we're going to go with the round world from the beginning concept, right? Sun and moon clearly there from day one. But there's a cost. A very significant cost. What is the greatest cost? Yes, we miss the wonderful story of, you know, them carrying the flower of the moon and accidentally dropping it, and that's why there are um, bl dark splotches on the moon, right? That's from the Book of Lost Tales. Um, we even miss the whole, like... Um, uh, the reason why the moon is kind of all over the place, right, is that he's uh, he's wayward and he's a hunter and he's uh, loving Aryan and sometimes comes too close to her and that's why we have eclipses, right? Um, 
uh, we lose all that stuff. But, you know, it's fun, but we can live without that. It doesn't cost that much to live without that stuff, right? But what is costly is the Eldar, right? How can they be the children of the stars? If, okay, so they awake and see the stars first. Yet, well, big whoop, the sun then rises six hours later. And they're living under the sun the whole time. I mean, the idea that the Eldar lived under the stars alone for, you know, thousands of years before the sun rose. Not to mention that it also means that the coming to Valinor and the light of the trees was a hundred times as mind-blowing, right? To a people who had never seen anything but starlight. So they come to Valinor and their world is rocked by the incredible abundance of light. Um, all those things get lost. And the trees themselves are reduced. Their significance is reduced. They're no longer... Um, again, in the old mythology, the virtue of the whole Aryan and Tilian myth is that the sun and moon, you know, the primary lights of uh, our world, these are but dim memories of the trees of Valinor, right? They are just derivative. The sun is bright and the sun is warm, but, you know, there are those who look up at the sun and just say, it's like one last remaining fruit of the tree of light that was, right? And so the idea of... Um, that kind of mythic expansion, right? Um, it's a huge loss. How could they, why would they even call themselves the Eldar? What reason would they have to fixate on the stars? Why would they love Varda most above all if it were just that, I mean, are they like baby chickens, right? That they just like form a a flash attachment upon the first thing that they see, which is the stars. I mean, it's a little dissatisfying, right? And they just imprint on the stars. That's the word. I forgot the word. They imprint on the stars. Um, uh, he, this is his attempt. This is his attempt to explain it. Green things that grow and the sun of summer were their delight. But nonetheless, they were ever moved most in heart by the stars. And the hours of twilight at morrow dim and even dim in clear weather were the times of their greatest joy. For in those hours, in the spring of the year, they had first awakened to life in Arda. In those hours, right? Um, okay. But I'm not buying it so much. Now, let me say, keep in mind, it's not like Tolkien wouldn't lose anything by sticking with the original story. Right? The original story, the original myth, doesn't work. We came across this problem uh, in some film when we were doing Silm Film Season 2, which was started with The Awakening of the Elves. and um, This is the Silmarillion Film Project, sorry, my, one of my podcast threads that I've been doing for the last five years or so now, um, as we've been planning a theoretical adaptation of the Silmarillion. Well, um, one of the questions we were confronted, we had to confront in Season 2, when, which was The Awakening of the Elves season, went from the from Quivienne to The Darkening of Valinor, Season 2 did. Anyway, what do they eat on the march? What do they eat? There's no sun, right? Everything's still under the sleep of, 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 uh, of uh, Yavanna, right? Like everything that had started to grow when the lamps were lit, she goes and puts it all to sleep, 
and it doesn't awake again until the sun rises. What on earth do all those elves eat? Um, you know, like, mushrooms? Nothing but mushrooms and things that grow in the dark? Are we really supposed to imagine all of Middle-earth as they cross it? To be like nothing green and growing is happening at all? We're to imagine them walking across a, you know, a, a rocky, slimy, dusty, perhaps mushroom-covered uh, landscape with nothing growing? I, that's um, not easy to see a way out of that problem either, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the starlight nourished them, what, the elves directly? Maybe. I mean, maybe the early elves could photosynthesize very low levels. I mean, I, but it's, you have to start waving your hands pretty, pretty quickly, right? And pretty vaguely at that kind of thing. And it is obvious that that kind of hand-waving he is not prepared to do anymore, right? He likes myth, and he'll still tell myths with correcting footnotes already. Right. But um, he. No, now we have them farming right on the march, stopping to farm. He can explain what they ate all the way through. Right. They started with a bunch of food and then they farmed for a long time. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen, it does take a lot of believing. Right. So again, yes. He's losing a lot of the mythic power of his older stories. There are some of those mythic ideas that he's just going to have to kind of let go of. But we see that he's trying to make it work. He's trying to square the circle here, right? They can still be the Eldar. And you notice he's not stopped calling them the Eldar, right? Um, he just has to think of a good reason why. And this is his reason. They basically imprinted on the stars. Because that's what the first thing was that they saw. And that's why it's so important that they saw the stars even before they rolled over and saw their wives. Right? Um, but back to the first paragraph. Um, sorry, uh, Astro Gypsy. Yeah, the forest and the farming and stuff, that's in a different version. Right? This is a, a an alternative story. It's an alternative myth. Um, and m note... The mushrooms and stuff I was just describing, like, that's that's not here. The sun's there, right? Green things that grow all over the place. No problems at all anymore. There just would have been problems if you had extended the mythology of the original Silmarillion and tried to make it work on the level that he's trying to make it work here. Um... Good lighting can be really helpful, Thistledown, I agree. Although the starlight is very romantic. Um, and I then honestly, that was one of the reasons why we were struggling with that. Um, with film film. Like imagining having to film everything in dim light for the whole first few seasons. Um, but anyway, okay. Let's uh, go back to that first paragraph. What do we have here in the at the end of the day? We have two things. First, we have him having achieved... So, back to his 144 pairs of elves, right? Remember, that was always the other option. And he was just talking about that in the last passage. That's one other way to solve the problem. Um, if we make the... Uh, if we make the other elves more numerous, then we can shrink the time back. If we start with 144 pairs, then we've got a huge mathematical advantage already, right? We, we can skip several generations. But remember, he originally dismissed that as bad mythology. And now here he's written a myth on exactly that. So why? What did he do in order to try to make it better mythology? Well, you notice what he did not do is just have all of them awakening at once. We were asking ourselves the question at the time when he said it was bad, bad mythology, we were asking ourselves the question, why is it, um, why is it bad mythology? What's wrong with it, right? And one of the things seemed to be that it, it, 
it doesn't have like a mythic center. Like there's no Adam and Eve characters, right? There's no, um, it's just like when a throng of people all awakes at once, like, what do we do? Where are we? Right. Um, so notice he's kind of trying to have it both ways. Three pairs of elves wake up first and they get named. And so we get this important mythic sense. We get the, well, Adam and Eve and plus two more sets of Adams and Eves, right? Um, here that we can attach to, that we get names for. Well, the Adams anyway, we get names for number one, two, and three. Um, elf one, elf two, and elf three, um, which is kind of Dr. Seuss-ish, but not quite. Anyway, um, uh, I do totally imagine them, by the way, going around with shirts with like a one and a two and a three and a little circle on it, on their chests, um, like thing one and thing two. But anyway, um, uh, oh, by the way, that would have made a great Halloween costume, wouldn't it? Really obscure, right? Have three people go as like elf one, like uh, elf one, elf two, and elf three. Um, that would have been fun. Anyway, sorry. Um, but um, he's trying to have it both ways, right? We start with those three. They are the center of the myth. And then they awaken more packs of elves, right? Um, each of which then becomes merely, a, the, merely I say, but each one be, becomes attached with one of them. So now we have the origin story of the three kindreds of the elves, right? Um, and so that kind of works. It kind of works. Um, we do get an origin story of the, um, um, we do get an origin story of the, origin of the three kindred, you know, of the Noldor and the Teleri and the um, Ingar slash Vanyar. Um, we do get something else out of it, right? And so that's interesting, right? That's kind of good. Um, did any of the rest of you feel weird about the Ingar story, though? According to this myth... What is the answer to the question, why are there fewer of the Ingar than the rest of the kindreds? The Ingar are the fewest of all the kindreds. We've always known that. Here, we get a mythic explanation of why that was. Yeah, Margaret, pettiness. Pettiness, envy. He got greedy. He got greedy. He noticed that they kept finding bigger and bigger packs of sleeping elves. So he kept being like, I'm going to wait for the biggest one of all so that I can have the biggest throng of elves, right? So this, these 96 elves or whatever that are here, right? That's not enough for me. I'm going to wait for the next one, which is going to be like 192 elves, right? And then I, being the first, shall have the greatest throng of all. Um, and then they ran out, right? He got too greedy. Turned out the 96 was the last set, and now there's no more. And so, oh, joke's on you, Imin. Only 14 total people for you and your kindred. And thus were the Ingar. So the Ingar, the special people of Manwe and Varda, um, you know, the, high, the, the, the light elves, the like highest of all the elves, have their origin story in like pettiness, envy, and greed. Um, uh, yeah, pie in the face for Imin, Michael. Exactly. That's, I, I felt a little let down by that, to be honest. Right? I mean, I, uh, I was just a smidge disappointed. Just a smidge disappointed. Um, especially since, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Um, I mean, didn't you kind of come away with the sense that the Teleri, like the last group, the 96ers, right, that they came across, um, were like eventually like the kind of your typical Teleri, the ones that 
were most in love with water because they woke up next to a waterfall and sang before they could speak, right? Um, uh, and um, were they meant to be? Like if Imin had been less petty, he would have chosen them and then they would have been Ingar. So, I mean, it almost creates this like the Teleri are not really supposed to be Teleri. They're really supposed to be Ingar, but Imin screwed it up. I mean, on the one hand, it provides a story, a backstory for all three groups of children, but it's um, not a great backstory in a sense. I mean, it's it kind of calls a lot of the things into question. So all in all, I wasn't a huge fan of uh, this myth of explanation, um, but we can see in context here, and I know as uh, uh, Carl explained, the this story is, is in, we're, a little, we're doing a little spoiler here, when we get to the War of the Jewels, apparently it's in the War of the Jewels, right? Um, but, um, uh, but what is not in the War of the Jewels is this full context. Right in the context of all this other aging and, and time stuff that he's working on. Uh, Christopher kind of pulled this story out of that context and provided it. Um, so now seeing where it fit, we can see it much better. We can see how it fits much better. Um, and we can see how he is playtesting again. But now he's playtesting not with math, but with myth. Right? Um, can I make it work on a mythic level? My personal answer is no not really working. I like the other one better. Um, but, um, you know, but it certainly does show that he is not willing to step away from the concept of myth of explanation, right? This idea of these kinds of legendary and mythic roots, he still wants to keep around. Um, and, uh, by the way, can you see one last thing? Uh, somebody was talking about how much fun it is that he is giving to an immortal race inaccurate legends about their history which seems a little strange at first but there is a justification for it right remember the reason he ditched the sun and moon myths was that elves like humans would make stories like that because they didn't know the truth. But elves would know the truth. Elves would know the world was not flat. Elves would know the world never was flat. The elves would know that the sun and moon have been there the whole time. And why would they know that? Because they were taught by the Valar who were there, right? So they have no excuse for telling ahistorical legends and myths about anything in the history of the world except one thing. Their own history. Because the Valar don't know the real story of what happened when the elves awoke. So the only thing that would be required in order to make them capable of having ahistorical myths about, you know, legends and myths about their own history, the only thing that's required is that the first ones have to not be around anymore. Which, they're not. Because most of them are Avari, or all of them are Avari, all the original elves state, right? So, um, so there we go. <laughs> right there, there we go. You can make it happen. You can make, but it seems a strange thing to try to shoehorn in, right? Like the elves are going to be left out of the beautiful privilege of having a historical legends, right? Um, so we got to give them their one crack, right, at having an a historical legend because it's literally the only thing that thou are don't know the story for, um. Uh, I guess. I mean, it still does seem like somebody would remember it well enough at some point to have corrected it, right? But, um, but whatever. Anyway, as I say, I don't consider this myth an enormously successful venture, but I think it is interesting in several ways to see that he's still interested in thinking in this way. He's not thrown this completely out the window even though he is throwing so many of those other older myths out the window all right well um another week another chapter uh so we'll see um i think i said read through chapter 11 next time 
that sounds sufficiently ambitious. I think I doubt we're going to get much further than 11 next time. You can maybe peek ahead to 12 if you're feeling feisty. Um, but we're going to continue uh, reading at about the same pace uh, that we've, you know, discussing at about the same pace we've been discussing, I think. So um, I'm hoping to get through 9, 10, and 11 next time. We'll see how we go. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, don't forget uh, Baymoot happening in just a couple days. And uh, if you get your tokens for the space program now, you can still, over these next few days, have an impact on which modules get offered in December. So thanks, everybody. See you guys later. Bye now.